Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this new GNV um, webinars. Today, the topic will be on unlocking investment in geothermal energy for two important topics, sustainable finance and the use of the LCI approach, notably the one we have developed in GNV. We have a lot of people uh, still connecting, so we will start in one to two minutes. So see you there. Okay, we have just passed the two minutes official delay to start the event. So welcome again to this GNV webinar. So as I was mentioning, we will develop now a discussion about uh, investment in geothermal energy, notably with sustainable finance and the use of a LCA approach. So what are we discussing today? Is following a series of webinars, you know, we started, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> We started in February to discuss um, how we can have a better regulatory framework, um, how we deal with air quality, with uh, seismicity issues, with social engagement, water quality. We had also high level policy event on just transition. Today is the end of our John V workshops. We will discuss on LCA and civil finance. Also, soon the end of the John V project because for your information, we will end John V project on the 30th of April, so in two weeks from now. What is the topic today? First, um, we will have a session on LCA and how we use life cycle assessment approach in the framework of sustainable finance. And secondly, we'll have a discussion during a round table on how sustainable finance can unlock investment in the geothermal sector. Of course, we want to have an interactive event. So you have a QA and a session with the audience you know that you can ask questions in the in the chat and as for the previous events we will try as much as possible to answer your question during the event but if it's not answered today we will come back to you in a follow-up email what is the agenda today so first i will give the floor to lorian michnik from the european investment bank to deliver a presentation on financing geothermal project after we'll have melanie Duzic, partner from GNV, coming from Army in France, presenting the GNV Simplified LCA tool. We will illustrate this tool with a case study on how the LCA application in Italy was done with Sarah Montemoli from NL Green Power. Then, Thomas Garabetian from EJEC will present the GNV recommendation on how implementing LCA. Following this series of presentations, we have a round table during the session two on how sustainable finance can unlock investment and here, in top of all the speakers from the session one, we'll have two more speakers, Paul Bonnet-Blanc from the French Ministry of Ecological Transition and Eva Ross from DG Energy and the European Commission. If you are here today, it's probably because you are familiar with GNV, but I remind you and uh, invite you to visit the GNV website where you can find all the information. You will find also the recording of this event, the presentation of the event today and from the previous also events we have organized um, specifically today 
we discuss LCA and you can see in the slide that in GNV we have a specific platform to show and to help you to use the simplified LCA tool but I will leave uh, Melanie to present this tool later on. So I thank you all for your attention. I wish you a good event and now I'm giving the floor to Lorian for the first presentation from the Investment Bank. Lorian, floor is yours. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Everything is fine for yours. Okay. Um, okay, so good morning and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the EIB's activities in sustainable finance and in the geothermal sector today. So the EIB is a public institution based in Luxembourg, which is acting as the financial arm of the European Union. With its strong EU and global presence, the bank is the largest multilateral lender and borrower in the world. And whilst it is governed by the EU member states and manages certain mandates on behalf of the European Commission, the bank essentially raises funds by issuing bonds on the international capital market. So from 2021, the EIB group only supports operations that are aligned to the goals and principles of the Paris Agreement. And in the context of the EU Green Deal and the acceleration of the transition to a green economy, the EIB will increase its share of lending to green investment from 40% today to at least 50% by 2025, which is expected to support the leveraging of 1 trillion euro of climate and environmental investment over the next decade. These commitments are operationalized in the bank's updated climate strategy, the Climate Bank Roadmap, which was approved unanimously in November last year by the EIB Board of Directors, which is composed of representatives from the EU member states. This set the bank as the first MDB to have published a detailed operational interpretation of the alignment. In the case of the energy sector, <clears throat> alignment is already secured through the adoption of the EIB energy lending policy, which was approved in November 2019 after public consultation involving industry, institutions, civil society and the public at large. And this milestone demonstrated the EIB's commitment to support the energy transformation. So there are five principles of the EIB's engagement in the energy sector to support the energy transition. So first, prioritizing energy efficiency. Second, enabling energy decarbonization through increased support for low or zero carbon technology. Third, increasing financing for decentralized energy production and innovative energy storage. Fourth, ensuring electricity grid investment. And fifth, increasing the impact of investment to support energy transformation outside of the EU. In addition, to provide support for the transition of lower income member states' national energy systems, the bank will be able to finance up to 75% of the eligible project cost for new energy investments in the 10 countries benefiting from the EU Modernization Fund, as well as in the Greece's islands. Concerning the geothermal sector, uh, the bank has been supporting geothermal projects since the late 1970s at a global level, and its support has uh, evolved in parallel with industrial developments in the sector worldwide. <clears throat> Cumulated, the bank's activities represent a total of 6 billion euros um, and include for more than one third lending dedicated to the EU member states. The majority of this support has been directed towards high enthalpy geothermal power and combined heat and power projects until 2010 and later expanded into district heating and cooling projects. 
Yeah. Okay. In terms of project requirements, a comprehensive appraisal process is performed in order to ensure that the projects submitted to the bank services are technically and environmentally sound. The projects should also demonstrate that they can bring socio-economic benefits to the society as a whole. For that purpose, the bank mobilizes project teams composed of engineers and economists, supported by procurement, environmental and social specialists. Specifically for geothermal projects, technical criteria are set for this sector. As the bank does not take on exploration resource risk, the availability of geothermal resource needs to be proven with drilling and testing or with appropriate control or analogues in order to be eligible for the bank's financing, except for innovative projects specifically targeting the innovation on exploration components. For power and heating and cooling generation, the bank only supports projects which emit less than 250 grams CO2 equivalent per kilowatt. -hour. Cases with artificial stimulation involved or potential induced seismicity risk are thoroughly assessed to ensure that any risk to the water, environment, existing infrastructure or to people are appropriately managed and mitigated. Projects should also be competitive against least cost economic alternatives, except for innovative projects which are not mature enough to be cost competitive. The external costs associated with greenhouse gas emissions and local air pollutants are systematically incorporated into this economic assessment. Part of this, the shadow cost of carbon used by the bank was recently updated as part of its Paris Alignment Framework, which rises from 80 euros per tonne CO2 today to 250 euros by 2030, reaching 800 euros by 2050, in line with the latest modeling evidence and is up for review on an annual basis. Uh, with regards to greenhouse gas emissions calculations, the EIB uses its own carbon footprint methodology to assess project absolute emissions and emissions variations brought about by the project against the most likely alternative. So the most likely alternative is defined as one which can meet similar output in technical terms and is credible in terms of economic and regulatory requirements. This methodology will draws upon the IPCC guidelines, the WRI GHG protocol, the IFI's harmonized approach to GHG accounting, as well as on ISO 14064. As the carbon footprint takes place ex ante and with limited information and resources, the methodology does not intend to cover a comprehensive life cycle analysis of a project, as such exercise can only be done credibly ex post with a large amount of information. Uh, so it's what we call scope-free emissions, which are the upstream and downstream emissions, are nevertheless already incorporated when these are considered significant in proportion to total project emissions. Um, also, as part of the methodology's regular review, the bank services are currently assessing how to potentially systematically include the upstream emissions from energy sources in its carbon footprint calculations, for all or certain sectors. This will require considerations such as how to balance uh, practicality versus precisions and magnitude levels required in these calculations, as well as how to ensure maintaining a level playing field across all technologies assessed by the bank. So prior to the climate bank roadmap, the bank's definition of climate action used to be harmonized with the methodology on climate finance tracking, which has been jointly developed uh, by MDB since 2012. Geothermal projects were considered climate action mitigation when the relative carbon emissions balance was negative at the time of appraisal, resulting in a net decrease in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The Climate Bank Roadmap now commits the bank to track its target according to the criteria set out in the EU taxonomy by aligning its own definitions of what is considered a sustainable investment wherever possible with those that will 
be a grid in the taxonomy. The bank will also ensure that all its activities, including the non-climate action elements, do no significant harm to the low carbon and climate resilient goals of the Paris Agreement, based on criteria to be defined in the EU taxonomy. The EIB's environmental and social standards will further be revised to properly integrate these new technical criteria. So until the publication of the delegated acts, the EIB uses interim definitions based on the principles and frameworks of the draft EU taxonomy, while it continues to apply the joint MDB climate finance methodology on not yet covered sectors and activities. For the geothermal sector, the interim eligibilities concern projects emitting less than 100 grams CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. The EIB will also make a midterm review of the energy lending policy in early 2022 in order to discuss the implications of the EU sustainable finance taxonomy and the further policy developments in the context of the European Green Deal and the EU external action. So that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lorian. Indeed, you already put the topic at the heart of your presentation, indeed, uh, how we deal with um, the different criteria and uh, how we use that in sustainable finance. And so it's why it will be my pleasure now to give the floor to Melanie, because you mentioned the already the technical topics, no? the ISO standard and, and uh, carbon footprint. And you will see what we have used, how you have used that in, in generally. So, Melanie, the floor is yours to represent the simplified LCA tool. Thank you. Um, can you all see my screen? Perfect. We see you and we see your screen. Perfect. Great. Thanks. So, yes, indeed. Um, when we talk about um, environmental impact, we need to find a way to quantify what the environmental impacts actually are. And um, um, Lorian Michnik just mentioned that um, in terms of climate change impacts, we can talk about carbon footprint. And um, if we want to do a life cycle assessment to quantify all the greenhouse gas emissions that are bound to a specific project, we need to have a lot of information and we need to have expert knowledge, um, as uh, I will be also showing here. But what we did with NGO Envy, uh, knowing that, is trying to develop simplified tools that can be applied relatively easily um, by people that um, maintain or uh, build geothermal installations. So I will um, give you more details about that. But first things first, um, what is life cycle assessment? Well, um, it's a methodology. If you look at a uh, geothermal power plant, for example, what you want to do with life cycle assessment is looking at the entire life cycle of the project. What are the environmental impacts? Environmental impact like climate change, but also impacts on health and environment, on eutrophication, acidification. And in order to do that, you need to know exactly for the entire life cycle of the installation, how much resources are needed, how much energy is needed, what raw materials you are using, how much water. So this takes quite a lot of time, but it's very powerful because then you can, for example, have results like this one for an enhanced geothermal system which produces heat. You can have um, an estimate of how much climate change impact you have, but also how much impact on the ecotoxicity, on the acidification, on human health, fossil depletion and minerals and metals depletion. And this is, for example, the result for an enhanced geothermal system for heat production. So the results are per kilowatt hour of heat produced if the installation is using the French electricity mix to power up all this equipment during the operation phase. And what you can see is if we were to consider, for example, a German electrical mix, um, you can find differences in the results, for example, for climate change, because the German electricity mix relies much more heavily on fossil fuels than um, the French electricity mix, which is mostly based on nuclear power. So this is one strength of um, life cycle assessment. And you could do similar results here, for example, for electricity producing geothermal power plants, where you have the grams of CO2 equivalent emitted per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. So similar to the carbon footprint that was mentioned before, except that here, 
In this case, we are really looking at the entire life cycle. So all the emissions that are bound to the um, sourcing of the raw materials up to the end of life of the geothermal installation. And you can see that there are differences within one technology, but also between the technologies. And you can also see here a comparison to um, the climate change impact for different electricity mixes. So variability between and within technologies, which is due on the one hand to the technology in itself, which is different, so requires different materials, but also within one technology, you can have variation in the technological parameters. Also, as I just showed for the enhanced geothermal system, depending on which electricity mix is used, the results can vary. Also, depending on what assumptions are made for the lifetime of the plant or the replacement rate, there can be variations. And another important part is the life cycle assessment methodology in itself requires some choices, which can influence the results. Depending on which system boundaries you consider, depending also on which impact categories you are actually looking at, because there are different methodologies behind them, you can have different results. So that's why within GeoNV, the first step that we took was to publish LCA guidelines for geothermal installations. But then these are aimed at geothermal at life cycle assessment experts that do a life cycle assessment of geothermal projects. So life cycle assessment, now I hope that you're convinced it's very powerful. It's a holistic approach, standardized and allows multi-criteria environmental impact. But it requires time, expert knowledge and data, which is why within GeoNV, we developed those simplified parameterized models, which are, which we have been talking about since the beginning of this um, event. And now I want to try to explain to you a bit how we derive those. So basically, if we go back to the life cycle of the geothermal plant that we had before, you might remember that I told you that you needed to have information on how much resources, energy, raw materials are used throughout all the life cycle stages. Well, how you can describe these flows, we call them inventory flows, is either using directly uh, the amount, so for example, the kilometers traveled to bring the materials from uh, the extracting site to um, the manufacturing site, or the amount of steel that is used to manufacture the well. But what you can also do is use parameters. For example, you can know, okay, the mass of steel that I need um, for my wells will depend on the length of the well itself. So that basically you just need to know how deep your well is to estimate this inventory flow. And within GeoNV, what we did for four different categories of geothermal installations, so enhanced geothermal system for heat generation, flash power plant for uh, electricity production, combined heat and power plant, um, and a geothermal plant for heat generation with organic ranking cycle, we um, parameterized all these inventory flows. So for example, for the enhanced geothermal system, we ended up with a model, a huge model with a lot of different parameters. And now you're still thinking, well, this is not simple, simple at all. But what we then did was to choose among all the parameters that you see here, the ones that are explaining most of the variability in the environmental impact. And now it starts to look a bit better. So you have less parameters that you have to, um, to know in order to be able to estimate for seven different impact categories, the environmental impact for this type. So the enhanced geothermal system for heat generation, for this type of installation, you are able to estimate those um, seven impact categories using the parameters that you see listed here. And here you can see again this electricity mix, which I showed at the beginning was very much influencing the results. You can um, know, uh, knowing how much of each type of electricity you have, um, you can then estimate yeah, the environmental impact here. So graphically, it means that you go from such an equation where we have all the parameters that we had at the beginning to something like that, for example, for the enhanced geothermal system for heat generation, for climate change. So here you can see again all the parameters that I showed just before in the slide. And you have other equations for the six other environmental impacts that I mentioned before. So those simplified models, they are available for four geothermal installation types. So for, four, for the four types that you see here, we have 
seven, each time seven equations that describe the environmental impact. And these equations, they are based on a limited number of parameters. So they can easily be applied. But how do you apply them? Well, first of all, you have to choose the geothermal installation type that represents the best the geothermal plants you are interested in. Then you have to find the values for the parameters that are necessary for uh, the to apply the equations that um, that are present for the different types. Um, and what is very important here is to also check that the parameters that for the plants that you are interested in are within the ranges of the different parameters. In fact, the simplified models that we developed, they are only applicable within the system boundaries that we define for each type of model. And then you simply have to input the parameter values in the equation to get the first estimates of the environmental impacts for the seven impact categories. Here, I just have to mention that you need to be careful. It does not replace a full life cycle assessment, but still it's a very powerful tool. And in order to make its application even more simple, on the JONB website, there will soon be a web tool that will be launched where you just have to choose the geothermal installation type, find the values of the parameters, and input the values. So no need for you to type in any equation anywhere. You can just apply the tool directly from the website. So to summarize the recommendations and outlook, um, the simplified parameterized models, they allow first estimates of the environmental impact of a specific type of geothermal installation. They rely on a limited number of parameters, they need to be applied within their applicability domains, and they do not replace full life cycle assessment models. They allow a first estimate. Future developments should validate the existing simplified models, because at the moment there are not that many life cycle assessment results that exist and that can be compared to the result we obtain with the simplified models. And future developments should also consider additional geothermal installation types to increase the number of available simplified models because this applicability domain is very strict. So you cannot apply the models for any type of installation. And the more uh, impact, the more geothermal categories are included, the more model will be available. And uh, the more easy it will get to, to have first estimates of the environmental impact for different types of uh, geothermal projects. I just want um, to highlight again the website of GeoNV, where soon there will be this web tool that is available. And um, I want to thank you for your attention, and we'll talk later about the questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melanie, for always interesting presentation. And maybe also art to GGS for some of you. So it's why I know it's my pleasure to give a flute to Sarah Montomini from NL to have a case studies to illustrate this LC approach. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning to everybody. I'm Sarah Montomoli and I work in NL Green Power as a, a responsible for the innovation department for geothermal technology. Uh, please let me know if you see my screen. We see you, we see your screen, but the presentation is not yet in full screen mode. No, it is perfect, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, show you uh, the Italian case study for the LCA, um, for the LCA approach used in the uh, GOMB project. Uh, we will uh, uh, have a look on the um, power plant selected for the study, which is Banyo Re4. Uh, then we will go through some technologies that are applied for environmental impact mitigation and the results of the LCA studies and some recommendations. And then we will go through uh, a new concept of substitute emission and what is going on uh, to validate this concept, and also new initiative for environmental impact mitigation that are used in our uh, power plant and that we will want to implement in the next future. Uh, so, uh, Banyone 4 is the Italian geopower plant uh, uh, that was an analyzed in the project and represents for Enel uh, the best environmental practice uh, where many environmental improvements uh, uh, have been implemented, uh, such as uh, innovative wet cooling towers, uh, an abutment process for ammonia, which is uh, 
the first one in our power plant. Uh, also, the gathering system of the uh, power, uh, binary three and four power plants are connected in order to reduce the free emission during, during the power plant shutdown. Uh, and also the two uh, treatment plant, uh, the EMIS plant, are connected in order to treat uh, um, the, um, uh, the gas stream when one is not available for maintenance or is shut down. Uh, Manure 4 is in operation since 2015 and it is the most recently built, uh, built plant. Uh, regarding the abatement of pollutants, in general, the AMIS technology is now considered a uh, best practice in Italy, uh, and all uh, um, the geothermal power plants are equipped with the AMIS technology uh, for treatment uh, of H2S and mercury in the uncondensable gas stream. I'm sorry, I have some. <laughs> okay. Um, in, the, in this picture, we can see uh, the effect of the installation of those plants in terms of uh, uh, H2S emissions during time. So we see that during time, the specific emission has been reduced significantly. And uh, also, uh, the controls from authorities uh, in the last year highlighted that 100% uh, of the plants uh, uh, are working within the limits. So with the elevated annual availability, uh, uh, also, the emission reduction in terms of H2S and mercury is uh, very, very high, between 19 and 95 percent. So uh, the LCA study uh, that was carried out in the GRG project uh, analyzed the different impact categories, uh, highlighting uh, very positive results for all the impact categories. Uh, the only anomaly um, is for the climate change uh, together with um, the other, um, the three categories with the higher value, values, which are atropication and acidification potential. Uh, this is why um, the impact of, uh, sorry, um, the three categories with the higher value are determined almost exclusively by emission to air during the operational phase. So this is why we have this anomaly specifically on the climate change impact. Uh, we have to say that uh, the emission during the operational phase, phase are essentially related to the geothermal fluid composition. But in this study, there is an effort that was not considered in the calculation because uh, uh, the emission during the operational phase are considered natural emission uh, that must be taken into account for a proper calculation of the uh, specific CO2 emission. Uh, um, the emission during the operational phase can be substitutive of natural ones. We will see it later what are the studies that are demonstrating this effect. And in this case, the impact value can be significantly reduced. Okay. So um, let's now dive into the substitutive emission concept uh, on the left side picture it is represented an imperturbed situation where a natural co2 emission from the soil is present in a um, in a disturbed way uh, so when a geothermal power plant is installed emission from the soil decreases so um, the uh, the natural emission are replaced by the gas emitted by the geothermal plants. So we have to say that the gas emitted by the plants are also treated through the AMIS and therefore uh, compared to the net uh, they are less polluting and also the dispersion into the atmosphere compared to the natural one is better due to the presence of the cooling tower. Uh, here on the left picture it is represented the thermal anomaly in Italy. Uh, on the right picture, uh, we can see um, the natural emission anomaly. So um, from those two pictures, we can see that uh, um, we can perfectly overlay the two maps uh, of the thermal anomaly and the, na uh, the natural emission anomaly. And we can see also that the, uh, the CO2 is emitted from the soil even where there is no geothermal reservoir. In a recent study of uh, uh, Professor Brana, um, he did a measurement of the CO2 emission from the soil, demonstrating that um, 
the, um, the natural emission are 10 times higher than the emission from the geo geothermal power plants. So following this concept, uh, if you look in detail to the zone with the uh, geothermal power plant presence that are here represented uh, in the blue areas, and we compare with green field areas uh, represented in, uh, in green, uh, with similar soil emission anomaly uh, is present, we see that uh, um, the flow from the ground of the areas affected by geothermal plants, so the blue one, uh, are equivalent uh, to the uh, green field area. So this is what uh, first evidence uh, of the substitute emission concept. Uh, a paper uh, on this, this study is uh, uh, in progress uh, and will be released in a special issue of the energy, of the energy uh, paper. Um, in any case, uh, uh, even from the, uh, the GeoMV project and from other uh, studies, uh, there are some uh, recommendations about some mitigation action that we can apply. For example, um, we need to limit the flow of direct emission with mitigation measure, and one, um, one action can be the metal removal from the uh, emission stream that can reduce the climate change impact value up to 40%. Uh, and also, uh, we need to monitor for a new, pro this is possible for new project, the natural state of emission before the development of geothermal plants. Uh, in this way, we can take into account uh, um, uh, the, um, the natural emission for the, spe the specific CO2 emission calculation. Uh, and this is possible, let's say, for, uh, for new plants. Uh, in case of areas or where already uh, we have already power plants, uh, presence of power plants, we can do the, the, the approach uh, that we have seen before. Uh, in Italy, we have to say that uh, uh, there is also a new regulation since February 2019 that obliges uh, to transfer the CO2 for free uh, in order to uh, reuse the CO2 in different uh, projects. So this is, uh, um, this is uh, uh, true for new uh, projects. So to get the authorization, you need to foresee CO2 reduce projects. And uh, um, for this reason, uh, in the next future, we are foreseeing new projects specifically for the um, methane abutment from the geothermal emission. Uh, in the past, uh, we had already patented uh, a, a catalyst uh, for application to geothermal gases, uh, specifically for the methane abutment. So we will develop an innovative process uh, uh, through um, a catalytic oxidation of methane. Uh, and also, uh, we need to think to uh, other kind of uh, um, reuse of the CO2 stream coming from the geothermal power plants. Uh, one example is the biofixing in biomasses, for example, for microalgae production like spirulina. Uh, an experience uh, was made a few years ago uh, using the geothermal CO2 and uh, the geothermal heat, and the project was quite successful. Uh, and also the uh, CO2 can be used for, um, for the food market, for example, for sparkling water and other drinks. And uh, we are also ev evaluating uh, other processes like the production of chemicals. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Indeed, it's always good to illustrate with a real case studies and uh, with an operator like Enel, where you have so many years of experience and geothermal power plants. So before continuing that doing a discussion, now I'm giving the floor to Thomas Garabetian to present the recommendations we have as a GMV project on implementing LCF. Thomas, floor is yours. You are muted, but we can see you and your slide. Yes, now everything should be fine. So good morning, everybody. 
So I'm going to, to present you a bit the joint view recommendation for uh, the application of uh, notably life cycle assessment and simplified uh, life cycle assessments, especially, especially uh, to uh, sustainable finance and how the two relate together. So first, um, uh, uh, one important thing to, to consider is that one of the outcome of the JONV project is really to has really been to look at the environmental regulatory framework for geothermal energy, um, notably on topics such as air emissions, water protection, uh, so aquifer protection and discharge of geothermal fluids to surface water when it's allowed, uh, and the regulatory framework that relate to these, uh, these impacts and how to minimize impacts at the same time as having the right policies to make sure uh, the thresholds are respected and uh, and so on, and obviously to to facilitate uh, public acceptance with uh, environmentally performant geothermal projects. Um, so indeed, as I just uh, mentioned, it, it's really important to have clear policies to make sure that um, communities uh, have a good access to information that geothermal projects are uh, well good for the environment in terms of uh, uh, climate change mitigation in terms of even local air pollution etc and so the joint the project has really explored these uh, these various topics it's quite relevant for the sustainable finance uh, framework so maybe first uh, we have not yet talked too much about uh, about sustainable finance itself uh, but at the European level, we are now uh, establishing criteria for uh, in a sustainable finance taxonomy, as it is called, which look to, to set some very clear criteria for uh, typically uh, identifying sustainable investment that contributes to climate change uh, mitigation, climate change adaptation, which are currently the criteria that are set. Uh, but we are also looking to uh, set criteria for the sustainable use and protection of water, uh, the transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. So this is what is currently being uh, examined by uh, the Platform on Sustainable Finance, which is a group of experts that looks at um, what criteria we should use actually for, to to define what is a sustainable investment environment. So sustainable finance is a very important topic for the geothermal industry because it's going to be the um, basically the framework in which the private finance sector and to some extent public finance uh, institutions such as uh, as Rory and just presented the EIB, which already is quite a, a, a trailblazing institution in terms of its uh, climate change investment impacts typically, uh, but all uh, financing institutions are going to be referring to this uh, sustainable finance framework to define how they, inv how they invest in, uh, well, sustainable investment, but especially renewable energy uh, for all their, um, uh, well, all, all the green funds will have to comply with these requirements, etc. So it is quite important to for the geothermal industry to fit within these criteria, and for these criteria as well to be very clear and uh, easy to access to uh, investors, uh, the finance sector, and also to to project developers uh, that they are easy to, to report on. Um, so typically already geothermal is a clear sustainable investment in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation, uh, and it also contributes to, to these other objectives, and I'm going to, to go a little bit over uh, some of the joint recommendations for typically uh, water protection and pollution prevention. Um, so right now, geothermal energy is considered, along with other renewable energy technologies, to comply with uh, climate change mitigation criteria by default. Uh, and must, however, justify compliance typically with EU regulations on other environmental impacts, typically on air pollution or aquifer protection. Um, and so what the uh, JONV uh, project has been undertaking um, with the development of the simplified LCA methodology can be used as a blueprint for other industries um, when we look at the establishment of the enlarged taxonomy, so with these other criteria, which are much harder to assess 
in the let's say typical way project sustainability is, is evaluated especially XMT uh, so here it's uh, it's going to be a, a very relevant tool uh, sustainable finance taxonomic criteria um, so uh, as I mentioned they must be um, quite uh, easy to access to finance stakeholders which do not want to be um, uh, expert typically in geothermal but in any sector that they want to, to invest in. So here the uh, GONV uh, life cycle assessment methodology can be a good tool for project developers to uh, easily present the possible benefits of their projects and they can be also a good tool for uh, possible investors to easily access information on prospective projects etc. So it's um, a good way with low, let's say, reporting cost uh, to both developers and investors to to access this um, uh, well, this environmental evaluation. Also beyond uh, the simple uh, topic of uh, of emissions. Um, yeah. Uh, now the. Um, Beyond just the, the topic of emissions, indeed, the JONV project has looked at recommendations typically on how to, to protect water, which is a very, very important topic in such a, a densely populated area as Europe. Uh, but typically, the aquifer protection framework in Europe is quite strict. Uh, however, as we see, so the, the current framework um, still varies from one country to another. And here, having a uh, normalization around best practices would really improve the consistency and the quality of uh, the environmental performance of geothermal projects. So typically, one of the, the current best practices, such as uh, the criteria in the Paris Basin, could, also, could be uh, applied in more countries. But we could also have, um, let's say, criteria and guidelines that also include contingent, contingencies sorry, for the, the best case scenarios or worst case scenarios sorry, uh, of, uh, of geothermal project development where really make sure we have as low an impact as possible. Um, obviously, this is quite important to reinforce the trust uh, and here having transparency of the monitoring process and data uh, of, uh, on the performance is quite an important aspect. Uh, people do not want their local water to be uh, contaminated by any activity. Uh, so uh, enforcing European legislations consistently is also very important because what we observe is that although we have quite a good uh, European framework, implementation varies uh, quite significantly across Europe. So this is very important also for uh, justifying the general sustainable finance criteria if they are based on this, uh, on this European uh, legislation. And uh, obviously as well, that's maybe more a, a technical recommendation for the, the geothermal sector, but really having uh, medium and long-term monitoring of geothermal reservoir to make sure they are uh, they, well, they are producing uh, uh, sustainably uh, and they are not depleting too quickly. Uh, surface water uh, contamination is uh, a risk, especially in countries where uh, discharge of geothermal uh, in surface water, geothermal brine typically in surface water is allowed. So usually when this is allowed, there are some strict uh, thresholds for uh, so, uh, a lot of uh, chemicals that the water may uh, contain. Uh, this must be uh, very, very thoroughly monitored and thresholds must be very clear and aligned obviously on uh, European uh, uh, legislation to make sure we do not have a PR issue with uh, typically contamination coming from uh, geothermal water, which would have a very, very negative impact on the, on the industry. Um, and obviously, uh, an overall recommendation of the JONV project is towards the reinjection of fluids, uh, which also has benefits in terms of the sustainability of the production uh, of the geothermal well. Uh, maintaining the, the pressure in the geothermal reservoir. So this is typically best practice. In some cases, it is not possible for existing project or uh, in some uh, in some uh, geological setting. Um, at any rate, there must be very uh, harmonized criteria for, for pollutants, including across industries, because what we might observe is that geothermal energy typically might have some specific criteria and then some other industries, uh, maybe the oil and gas, 
uh, might have some more lenient um, uh, criteria. So there must really be an harmonization to make sure we have uh, best environmental practices, especially in the framework of, uh, of the sustainable finance uh, criteria. Uh, for air pollution, the um, project has also been looking at uh, mitigating uh, air pollution. So here, Sarah has, uh, has presented some of the best practices coming from Italy, which is really one of the best case scenarios in uh, mitigating and monitoring the, uh, the air pollutions from uh, from geothermal energy here having an important frequency of reporting is very important um, uh, threshold on pollutants uh, are currently different from one country to another when they are not defined at the european level um, and data is not always public so these are both areas where uh, improvement is possible to have a nomination on best practices and here, typically, uh, Tuscany is uh, a very leading uh, best practice. Um, so some of the joint recommendation is to monitor air emissions during the uh, well, the whole project uh, lifetime from construction to um, to also operation, and also to establish uh, standards uh, and thresholds for pollutants that are currently not covered by EU regulation. So here we are especially thinking about H2S. Um, HG, which I'm sorry, I never remember if it's mercury or lead. Uh, and uh, then technical measures must be implemented uh, to address potential issues. Um, now, on sustainable finance specifically, um, first, one of the, the main aspects that the, the JNB project would, uh, would recommend, or oh, uh, as general uh, recommendation uh, on behalf of the, the geothermal sector, is that fossil fuel combustion must not be considered uh, eligible as sustainable finance. Uh, they contribute to climate change, obviously, and to a wide range of other environmental impact. Um, they also obviously compete with uh, renewable energy to attract finance, and currently the fossil sector is much more competitive to uh, attracting private finance and renewables and they do not need uh, the sustainable finance level and indeed uh, do not quite deserve it. Um, there are um, also a need for indicators that must be clear, comparable across projects and technologies, so really having a level playing field in the uh, reporting. Obviously different technologies will have uh, different specific impacts um, uh, wind turbines do not have the same specific uh, local environmental impacts as uh, geothermal uh, projects, but so reporting will be different. But overall, where comparable, uh, there must be uh, similar uh, criteria uh, uh, with similar reporting requirements. Um, simplified LCA methodologies are a robust basis to. Uh, to answer this need for technical screening criteria and to uh, have some form of simplified reporting uh, basically for, for projects. Um, the technical screening criteria must obviously be uh, fit within the European uh, environmental legislation framework when possible uh, and to facilitate the, the consistency of the guidelines with a real life projects operation and to ensure as well a straightforward reporting and trust with the, uh, uh, the environmental, uh, well, the sustainable finance criteria and the projects that are validated by them. Uh, the value chain of industries must be considered and here clearly uh, we have the uh, uh, enlargement of the um, taxonomy to typically circular economy, which I have not been too much details, but um, it, it is a very positive step um, and here, typically, in terms of geothermal energy, we have the production of um, sustainable materials uh, from geothermal brines, typically. So Sarah mentioned uh, some possible applications also uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, growing algae, etc., uh, which are very relevant. We can also mention lithium, which is a very increasingly important topic in the, uh, um, in the industry. And geothermal lithium is a very environmentally performant uh, uh, mineral production technology compared to other uh, alternatives. Um, another important aspect as well that may be uh, a bit less in the current framework of the sustainable finance uh, criteria, but it's important also to consider uh, 
uh, how to distinguish technology that displays environmental impact. So really, for instance, if you install a geothermal project instead of a gas boiler uh, or a, a gas uh, a plant, you are going to really replace uh, energy production and there will be a net decrease in emission. If you add, uh, I don't know, let's say a PV panels on the roof, you are not actually displacing necessarily emission, you are adding uh, generation capacity and you might have some just overall increase in electricity consumption. So things may not be as uh, net as that. So when you have measurable displacement of emissions, uh, this should also go to, to the credit of uh, the sustainable investment. And that's also true for other env environmental impacts, sorry. If you replace um, a polluting heat plant, uh, for instance, for, for coal uh, in a city with a just normal district heating, you have uh, net benefits in terms of uh, obviously emissions of CO2, but also local pollution uh, from various, uh, various pollutions. So this is also obviously a geothermal benefit. Now for the implementation of uh, the simplified LCA methodology, um, it is obviously a good tool for the uh, reporting uh, towards uh, sustainability criteria as compliance and for the public acceptance uh, by local communities. So here, uh, the so development of, uh, so how do we uh, uh, implement this, uh, this simplified LCA? First, via the, the development of robust methodologies to produce uh, this assessment and also to, uh, establish this methodology as a tool to, uh, to, to really facilitate reporting uh, by developers and to facilitate access to information by uh, investors in the case of sustainable finance, but also by local communities to uh, foster public acceptance. But that's uh, another trendy webinar, obviously. Um, then when do we use this, uh, this methodology? Um, well, prior to to the uh, implementation of project, it is a very interesting tool because uh, of its simplified nature. So you don't need as much information as you might need actually for an exhaustive LCA as, uh, as Melanie mentioned. Um, so in that case, it's really interesting uh, to use for uh, providing information to financial institutions, uh, etc. Now, where uh, do we get information about a simplified LCA methodology. So obviously the JoNV project is a very good uh, resource. So I invite you to, to go through uh, the report on the simplified LTA assessment. Uh, and this as a so described methodology can especially be translated uh, to other sectors. Obviously there will need to be some adjustments, but it is a really interesting tool uh, that can be used uh, not only in the geothermal industry, but in all uh, industry that uh, uh, that can be considered sustainable investments. So that is uh, all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And uh, looking forward to, to the upcoming discussion. Thank you, Thomas. Um, indeed, now with your presentation, we are ending the first session, which was about LCF and sustainable finance. And now we move to the round table in session two, and I give it for Thomas to moderate this session and to welcome the two new speakers, Paul Bonneblanc and Eva Rousseau. Thomas, I give you a floor to be moderator. Yes, so thank you, Philippe. Um, so what I would do uh, first is to invite, um, well, everybody to to switch on their, their webcam if they if they wish to to participate in the session. So especially uh, Paul and Eva. So welcome to to the discussion. Uh, good morning. I just managed to unmute myself. I need to... All right. So, so good morning, uh, Paul and Eva. Maybe we, we are going to, to start the, the session with you. Um, so we have heard uh, a lot about um, what criteria for 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 geothermal uh, for, for investments in geothermal energies, uh, energy projects? What um, criteria for um, building up uh, life cycle assessment methodology? Uh, 
uh, see to ng project recommendation and how to to use this methodology um maybe paul uh what uh is the perspective at the level of uh, eu member states so in your case uh, france on applying the sustainable finance framework um and what role do uh, what impact do you see it, it would have on the way uh, the french authorities uh, considered support to to geothermal uh, projects um hello everyone um well on, on our side we have uh, i would say we have a long history of uh, financing uh, deep geothermal uh, investment uh, in particular uh, for heat producing heat uh, what i see is um, is probably there will be a boost or also a, a standardization we we have currently our own tools so uh, uh, it will be in, uh, incorporated uh, I, I think little by little uh, well just to set the scene uh, briefly uh, about the french context uh, we we have the heat fund for investment and one component of the heat fund is uh, uh, diverted to uh, for the the mitigation and the first point i want to uh, uh, highlight is uh, uh, I, I think well sus sustainable finance uh, of course, will work fine uh, for, for for geothermal uh, energy, but at the same time, there is a specifics about uh, geothermal energy, and and at least as far as we are concerned in, in France, uh, the mitigation part is very important. And sometimes, you know, sustainable finance does not uh, properly address this issue, which is which we I think we will we will uh, we have to. We have to have in in the, to develop uh, geothermal uh, projects. All right, thank you, um, Eva. Maybe you 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 can uh, give us uh, the perspective of the of the commission, especially of uh, DG engineering, the the process of uh, establishing these criteria and um, how to uh, are they going to 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 be used also um or whether they are going to be used also beyond just the private sector and uh by the the commission's uh, uh services we know the the commission has a lot of uh, uh facilities to uh support um clean energy projects we we can for instance refer the very recent recovery fund to to recover from the uh, covid crisis which has some uh, climate investment criteria I think you are muted still. Okay. So uh, yeah. thank you, thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, first of all, uh, what I uh, emphasize that um, uh, there is a big investment wave and uh, basically really a tsunami of funding uh, from the uh, European Union uh, for uh, sustainable energy and uh, climate uh, mitigation and climate adaptation. Uh, so this is a, a historic opportunity uh, basically uh, that uh, uh, the geothermal industry and any other re renewable um, industrial sector really should uh, uh, size. Um, we have obviously the uh, uh, modified uh, multi-annual financial framework uh, with uh, more than one trillion euro uh, budget and we have the next generation EU uh, with uh, more than 700 billion euro and a large portion of this uh, budget is uh, being allocated for uh, climate mainstreaming and clean energy. Uh, and um, there is a 30% horizontal uh, target for the spending out of these funds. And we have uh, many other uh, uh, financing facilities uh, that have uh, much higher uh, mainstreaming uh, for um, climate and sustainable energy, uh, uh, for example, the Invest EU is uh, around 70%, and then some others uh, even higher. 
Um, so we are in a context where uh, member states are preparing their uh, recovery and resilience plans um, uh, to uh, uh, allocate it for um, uh, the recovery investment. And again, a large portion of this is going to uh, the energy sector uh, uh, for the Green Deal uh, implementation. Uh, which is seen as uh, the growth engine, uh, not just uh, in general, but also in, in the context of the current uh, COVID crisis. Um, so what I would like to uh, give as a first message is that uh, there is an unprecedented amount of uh, public uh, funds and money uh, that member states can use and that can be um, uh, directed to uh, uh, geothermal projects, uh, and this is something that the industry should, uh, should, should size as far as possible. Uh, we have many uh, initiatives uh, to facilitate a green investment um, and um, uh, channel this investment towards the, the objectives of the Green Deal, and within that, this uh, already the preparation uh, to implement the tar uh, climate target plan uh, for as a, and a very important milestone for uh, the carbon neutral economy and the Green Deal uh, aims to achieve. Um, and one of those is obviously the taxonomy regulation um, that uh, the Delegated Act is now being uh, finalized. Uh, but what is important uh, for any uh, renewable industry to uh, realize that uh, carbon emission reduction and uh, 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 very high environmental standards are uh, in the focus of this new spending wave um, and the taxonomy uh, uh, regulation aims to uh, basically channel uh, uh, the private investment uh, uh, towards the green investment uh, with very high uh, CO2 emission reduction uh, performance and also uh, with a performance that is fully aligned with the do not significant harm uh, principle. Uh, that means that environmental protection across the board in terms of uh, water protection, air pollution, uh, soil, and uh, uh, biodiversity is also very important uh, uh, aspects of, of this uh, more stricter environmental protection approach for uh, public spending and also for private spending. And uh, the two types of spending obviously interacts because in uh, many cases, um, the public uh, uh, funding uh, guarantees or loans are uh, uh, the seed money, to, so to speak, or a very big portion uh, for private investors' willingness to come in. So uh, these type of uh, criteria are uh, going to impact investment across the board uh, through the financing instruments and mechanism uh, that we see operating on the market. Yeah. So, thank you, Eva. Um, now, I, I'm going to, to run through uh, a, a few of the questions that, that we receive for, for speakers. So, to the audience, if you have uh, any questions, uh, please also feel free to, to submit them. Uh, we'll try to, to go through most of them. Uh, if we can. Uh, maybe the first question is for uh, uh, Lorian. Um, it's whether the prevention of harm principle is uh, is including in the in the criteria uh, of the EIB. Yes, so the EIB has a, an environmental and social standard uh, framework in place. Uh, so we are already um, applying these um, uh, criteria uh, on our projects uh, uh, since a long time uh, and we are going to align that uh, in the coming year or next year I mean, or in 2022 uh, whenever it's available uh, with the EU taxonomy uh, environmental uh, sustainability criteria. Yes, so there will be um, an update of the, our environmental and social standard uh, on time uh, when we'll have more information. 
Okay, good, thank you. Uh, now we have uh, also a question for um, Melanie, uh, but I guess to 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 the old uh, train V uh, consortium, which is whether uh, there will also be a, a methodology, I suppose, for for LCA for um, project that use uh, geology for long-term heat storage. Uh, for instance, uh, the question asks uh, to use a project that would use variable wind energy to produce heat used uh, a week later, uh, etc. Uh, so. As such, I don't think so. Um, it would be interesting to look at definitely, but uh, I think as such within GeoNV, that's not something that is planned. No? Yeah. yeah, I suppose uh, the current uh, criteria do not really allow to, to do it at this stage, but it could be uh, maybe updated uh, at some point. Um, yes, so, um, now that there is a question, uh, especially for, for Sarah. Um, regarding the um i'm sorry it's a very long question I'm trying to to summarize it uh, yes yeah, it, it it's not a big question related to to the lcre and typical cost of your thermal plant but i i suppose it might be a, a bit beyond uh, the, the discussion um but overall, uh, maybe Sarah, if you have uh, a quick comment on the, uh, um, maybe how, so, yeah, the, 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 the role that uh, CO2 pricing, for instance, could have on geothermal developments, um, overall, maybe in Italy, but if you have some, uh, some examples beyond. I think you, you are still muted. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yes, of course, uh, today in Italy, um, uh, um, so the, the CO2 is emet directly emitted from our plants uh, uh, and we have no cost for this, uh, uh, for this emission. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the treatment of the CO2 as I, um, as I uh, represented in the, in, the, in the presentation uh, is quite high because our company has invested a lot of money during the time, uh, up to 20 million of euros for the treatment, the Amis plant treatment. So what I can say is that uh, um, in general, uh, all these methodologies uh, to calculate the environmental impact, uh, uh, specifically in terms of uh, climate change impact, uh, uh, we need to be very careful because uh, they have, we have some limitation about uh, the input data for these, uh, um, for these uh, tools. Uh, and the first example, which is the, uh, the, most, uh, the most impactant on the, on the value, on the resulted value, is the uh, direct emission of CO2 that is taken into consideration as an input data. Because if we think that uh, uh, we can uh, evaluate it as a 100% uh, substitutive of a natural one, uh, we can say that the presence of uh, a geothermal power plant uh, can improve uh, the environmental impact of a natural environment because we treat uh, what we emit compared to the natural presence. So um, uh, in, in this approach, uh, we can say that uh, um, there is only, po posi only positive aspects. So um, I, I, I hope that in the next future, this evidence uh, uh, from the studies that will be developed in the in next months uh, will be completed and that, that we'll be able to evaluate uh, much, much better this effect in order to properly assess the environmental impact and then do some economic evaluation. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, maybe now I'm going to, to, to ask a, a question to, to the whole panel, so feel free to, to answer if you have uh, uh, some, uh, some opinion. But, um, with the sustainable finance framework, we have a focus towards uh, pushing the, the private sector to invest more in sustainable in, in uh, sustainable investment. Uh, how do we get the um, private sector to to do so for for just uh, specifically? So, uh, what strategy maybe should the the industry 
uh, adopt uh, to attract sustainable finance or what strategy should we set up uh, in terms of uh, designing support schemes to attract more private uh, finance? I don't know if someone wants to start on that, otherwise I will uh, will allocate someone uh, arbitrarily. Uh, maybe Paul, if you have a, uh, an opinion. Um, well, well, difficult question again with heat. Uh, I, I think um, uh, that is uh, maybe the main. Uh, well, heating cities would be a challenge uh, in Europe, but everywhere where uh, with with moderate cl uh, climate and and uh, and uh, a need for uh, for uh, heating the these big cities that are growing. Um, so uh, what I want to point out is that uh, uh, depending of countries, but let's say I, I, I'm, I'm, I will be talking about uh, about France, um, it's it's also to have private, but also uh, funding bodies from the cities or or a group of cities. Uh, so I think uh, I will also include those uh, maybe specific. Uh, a special purpose vehicle uh, as a company that might be private, but that that also includes uh, cities uh, which uh, which want to uh, to uh, resolve the, uh, the the difficulties of uh, having a, a low carbon uh, heating uh, uh, heating system. Um, and and I guess probably uh, this is uh, this is also a. Uh, 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 a discussion we have to have uh, with uh, uh, well, they they are not part of the private sector. Obviously, cities they are more and more involved in well, specific development plan and where well, that that private finance uh, uh, come into play. But also uh, having a, a say again specifically. But I think also all the renewables are at stake uh, uh, in in this uh, in this regard. Uh, and I think that catalyzed because they are both on demand and I mean uh, on on the demand side, and as well on on providing uh, also uh, this uh, renewable energy. So, so I I, I think getting municipalities and and uh, public bodies on board is is also very important. Thank you. Um... Maybe uh, Eva, if you want to to come in, I know the, the Commission has a, a lot of um, uh, of programs to blend public and private finance. So uh, you've already come uh, some way in that regard. So what we have is, is a framework, uh, and uh, this is uh, for the industry, member states, and local communities to to. Um, we actually develop project and strategies. Uh, how the, as I mentioned, the very significant amount of uh, public budget and and the, the private uh, uh, money that is available and ready to invest uh, could be harnessed. But uh, what I would like to highlight is that, um, as Paul uh, said, that there is a very big need. A massive amount of uh, uh, fossil energy will need to be replaced in the next uh, uh, couple of decades. And um, with the climate target plan and uh, review revisions of, uh, of uh, many, many uh, EU legislation uh, to align it with the Green Deal, um, we look at an accelerated uh, transition towards carbon neutrality. Um, so uh, there is, the money is uh, there uh, from the EU side, uh, from the public side, and uh, uh, it's also available uh, from the private side. Um, it is very important that member states and local communities uh, uh, really um, do a good planning. Um, of what is that they need to do, what kind of projects need to support. Uh, for ge geothermal energy, there is very uh, effectively a very big need to develop uh, this source and use the vast potential that is undeveloped in Europe, especially for uh, heating. Uh, 
um, because we have a heating sector that is half of the energy consumption and uh, 75, 76% of it is uh, based on fossil fuels. So this uh, enormous amount of energy, which is at EU level, uh, is around 500 MTOE, need to be shifted towards uh, uh, renewables and uh, carbon neutral solutions. And uh, geothermal energy here uh, has a very uh, big place to step in. And it would be important that the industry sees this opportunity. Uh, and the reason for this, because uh, we cannot really shift that much amount of fossil fuels to um, bioenergy, biomass, which is currently the main uh, source of renewable energy, around 90% almost, uh, because it's simply not going to be sustainable. Uh, so we need alternatives and uh, geothermal is that is everywhere available. Um, it has an added uh, benef uh, uh, added uh, advantage that it is highly energy efficient. We also have a principle that energy efficiency first. Uh, so if we need to shift this amount of energy to uh, a non-fossil uh, renewable, uh, the geothermal energy has potentially a very big uh, role to play um, because uh, the other alternatives have much more problems or difficulties to come in. I already mentioned biomass, but if we do not manage to develop direct renewable heat, which is geothermal and solar thermal, and uh, um, in a very significant scale, uh, we need to. We will need to uh, um, foresee a much uh, more uh, intensive deployment of renewable electricity for the heating sector. Uh, potentially, uh, not just direct electricity, but also uh, 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 so-called RFNBOs, renewable fuels of bi non-biological origin, such as hydrogen or synthetic gases which are much more expensive and from an energy efficiency perspective uh, a lot less uh, efficient. So geothermal has a big uh, place to, to fill here um, and uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, it's really about the capacity of member states and local communities to organize the projects and, uh, and basically uh, uh, have an absorption capacity for the public and private investment uh, that is uh, being uh, deployed uh, right now. So thank you, Eva. Maybe uh, following on that, uh, Sarah, if you have some uh, some perspective on how to to scale up these um, these investments from um, uh, well from the perspective already of a, a large geothermal operator. Uh, sorry, Thomas, I, I didn't get your question. Yes, uh, it, uh, the question was whether you, following on, uh, on Eva's comments about the so potential of geothermal, but really the need to to plan investments um, and to uh, well to to scale up quite significantly investments in heating and cooling, but also to to some degree in uh, in electricity production. So, from yes. your perspective as a large operator. Um, yes, the, the most, of course, in, in the GeoEnvy project, uh, uh, many of these uh, aspects were, were analyzed. Uh, um, so what, what are the main barriers uh, for the development? Uh, uh, so, for example, in Italy, even if we have uh, uh, already some, uh, um, some activities uh, for the availability of the resources, so we need where we, we know where uh, we can, uh, uh, from a technological point of view, uh, we can improve our uh, production, so to build new new plants, etc. But uh, the main challenges uh, are the permitting ones, so uh, and the specif specifically for the uh, relationship with uh, uh, local communities uh, uh, and uh, um, to demonstrate that the geothermal projects uh, are environmental friendly and are good uh, uh, in all the different uh, impacts that uh, uh, we can imagine uh, for local communities in general uh, uh, and for the, uh, the, the objective of decarbonization of uh, our country and of Europe in general. 
So demonstrated that the, the geothermal energy uh, is a key technology uh, to reach the, the target of decarbonization that we have uh, uh, is very important. And I think in JoMB we did a very good job uh, and we also uh, highlighted uh, um, the future activity that we need to carry on in order to, um, in order to define uh, in uh, an objective way uh, that uh, this is true, because uh, uh, this is something that is missing and is already put in the uh, policy table. So uh, I think this is very important uh, from a scientific point of view. Uh, to highlight uh, uh, what is really the situation of the geothermal project. So, yeah, I think these are the, the main, uh, uh, the main uh, things to do and uh, to, uh, to try to improve all together. Yes. Thank you. Uh, now maybe, uh, Lorian, uh, one um, uh, question for you. As uh, an organization, that, uh, as belonging to an organization that is uh, investing in projects but also quite cautious about the um, uh, let's say uh, trust rating such as typically the the triple a uh, grade etc uh, for the, the security of investment which is also the case of things like pensions funds uh, do you think that having a sustainable finance taxonomy would also help uh, directing um, these type of organization more towards uh, renewable uh, projects and especially to us or not. Um, so you want me to answer some pension funds, is it? Or? Uh, more generally, whether, uh, well, let's say whether having these sustainable finance uh, criteria as basically rules for, for all investments will also help perceive uh, or grade in renewable investments as uh, more secure and therefore more accessible to uh, AAA organizations. I think that's the objective uh, of the, you know, the, uh, especially the EU taxonomy. I mean, it's to have a common uh, kind of ground uh, for everyone uh, to, you know, public or private to invest and uh, that should give more confidence uh, in, uh, and give uh, more support to this uh, type of investment. Um, yes. For EIB, I mean, with, uh, I mean, I mean, one of our aim was, is also to crowd in private investment by engaging into projects and, you know, making it public that we do it. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully uh, we are having enough credibility as an institution uh, also to, to, to leverage uh, in the future. I mean, we are already leveraging, but more in the future uh, by... Uh, embarking in you know this uh, taxonomy alignment so yes. okay thank you uh, we are reaching uh, the the end of the um, of the, the webinar but maybe uh, just uh, two last questions from the audience one for for melanie uh, which is asking what uh, would be the, the most reliable uh, sources to compare geothermal lca to uh, other uh, sources. The question mentions the IPCC, but if you have some uh, some other suggestions. Uh... Uh, yeah, definitely the IPCC, I think it's a good start, but uh, as far as I remember, they mostly focus on climate change. So if you would want to look at other uh, environmental impacts, you probably need to go through scientific literature, looking through Google Scholar and looking for life cycle assessment of different mm -hmm. Uh, renewable energy technologies or other technologies that you would want to look at. And in the GeoEnergy project, we have some degree of uh, of comparison, don't we? So it's we true. Can... Yeah, I think there was also a review done. So yeah, indeed. So that's already a, a good first step. I expect and maybe another the last question for for Eva, um, which is a, a larger question, which we we will uh, send to you to you later. But maybe generally the question is about uh, the modernization fund and some geothermal project applications that were declined uh, being for heat uh, on the argument that the fund is more focused on electricity. And so, um, yeah, the question uh, being what's your opinion on the issue, but more generally, uh, whether there should be this hierarchy between electricity and heat to, to the deployment of renewables. 
Yes, and this is unfortunately still an issue that the heating sector doesn't get um, uh, sufficient priority. Um, uh, we have started uh, later than the electric sector, and uh, we hope that the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive and uh, the General Framework Energy Efficiency Directive uh, will uh, put the uh, heating and cooling sector more, much more in priority. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so, but I don't think that uh, there is, um, so I'm a bit surprised that electricity is, uh, would be a, the focus for electricity would be an exclusion for, for, for renewable heat. Heating and cooling, I think um, still there are in uh, plenty of uh, budget and opportunity and the good one is to be found. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I think we it is now 12, so we, we are reaching the, the end of the webinar. So I uh, warmly thank you all for, for your participation to, to this uh, session and more Sorry. generally to... Yes? Sorry, Thomas. Can I ask a last question, actually, on the GONV uh, uh, project? Or? Yes. Um, okay, I mean, I, I was just curious to know, I mean, in the context of this study, if uh, you uh, look at the actual proportion of upstream emissions compared to total emissions for geothermal project, and if you have any kind of uh, statistics on that, in percentage or what can we what are we looking at you know in terms of percentage yeah it, it can, could you repeat the question there was some uh, interferences i could not hear okay uh sorry i'm turning uh, i'm turning off my camera maybe it's working better uh, no, no i was um curious to know i mean in the context of the gonv uh, study if you analyze you know the actual proportion of upstream emissions compared to total emissions in geothermal project and if you have any kind of you know uh, knowledge or you know, insights on what's the magnitude in terms of percentage that we are looking at. Yeah. I think Melanie, maybe you're you're the best place to, to answer that. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is something that we answered with uh, one of the deliverables where we analyzed for a few case studies the contribution of the different life cycle stages to the total environmental impact. So I believe it's the D 3.3, the deliverable 3.3. I'm not sure if it's on the website yet, but um, it will, it does give some, uh, this kind of information that you are asking for. So, uh, yeah, that's something we looked at. Right. So maybe we can uh, send you the, the deliverable in, uh, in follow up. Um, mm -hmm. So now, except if there are uh, uh, last questions uh, in the panel. Otherwise, I think we can uh, we can close the session. So thank you all for for participating. Uh, thank you to to the audience for for your questions and for your attention. Um, we're very happy to to have been able to have these various uh, geo NV uh, webinars and other projects will uh, reach its end uh, within two weeks. But I invite you to to go to the Sergio NG website and consult uh, the various deliverables, which are uh, all very valuable. Um, so thank you all, and uh, I wish you uh, a good day. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.